you know, is uh, we do a lot of things to improve and better our lives, right? We go to school to get an education so that we can function well in society, get a decent or great paying job to provide for ourselves and our family. We exercise and eat right, or, or at least feel guilty about not doing that, uh, one of the two. Uh, but we know we should be doing that so that we can be physically fit and have the best opportunity to enjoy these bodies that God has given us and move about in the world. We read books about how to, good, how to have good uh, friendships and marriages. We read books about parenting so we can raise awesome kids. We read books about how to thrive in business, right? We learn about how to manage our money so that we can be less stressed about that and, and have more of it to be able to provide for ourselves and give to the things that God has called us to. We learn about, uh, we take vacations so that we can rest and refresh and unwind from the mundane and the stressful parts of our lives. Many of our jobs as well revolve around improving the world around us, right? Engineers try to figure out how do we make buildings and medical devices and and, and the millions of products and gadgets and various things that we rely on even better than the last one. Teachers help us gain the knowledge and insight we need about our world. Nurses and doctors help others be healthier. Service workers provide great dining experiences or hotel stays or make our shopping more fun and fruitful. Our politicians campaign on promises to improve our lives and make them better and to advance our national interests in the world. Our companies sell us products, trying to assure us that if we buy this razor, our shaving will be a wonderful experience. If we buy this bed, we'll never have a bad night's sleep again. And if we buy these beverages, our thirst will be quenched and we'll never need to drink again. Just this quick discussion shows us that much of our lives revolve around improvement. Improvement of ourselves, improvement of our lives in general, others' lives, or the world in which we live. In one way or another, as human beings, we are either striving for improvement or wishing that we could be better off or improving. And this natural impulse is part of our existence because we live in a world that can use improvement. I'm pretty happy with my five-bladed razor. There was a point in time when I thought, I wonder what it would be like to go back to a straight razor. And I looked it all up and said, wow, that's really cool. Then I looked on YouTube and people were like, you're going to cut yourself. And I'm like, you know what? I'm pretty good with my five-bladed razor that I have. I'm grateful for conscientious and knowledgeable doctors that help me with diseases and injuries so that I can have a he as healthy a life as possible. I'm thankful for engineers who can develop safe buildings and cars that get 50 miles per gallon and reduce pollution so that we can breathe cleaner air. We also know that much of our lives need improvement in our world because of moral and spiritual sickness. Uh, last week we talked about how because of our sinful, rebellious desires, we as human beings collectively have made a mess of things on this planet. Uh, each of us is trying to direct our own play and we're frustrated when the play we're directing in the vision that we have of our lives and that we're desperately trying to make work doesn't work out because of our inadequacies, inadequacies or even worse, someone else's directorial decisions that interrupt our play. And so it creates a great deal of sinful thoughts and actions and spiritual damage and conflict with other people, other directors, if you will. The good news we saw last week in the glorious gospel is that God our Father sent Jesus, his only begotten Son, to change our hearts and minds from desiring to live our lives apart from him and direct our own play, and instead a desire to love him and a desire to allow him to be the one that directs the course of our lives, to lead us in this world. And when we trust in Christ, we are freed from sinful rebellion and can live with God. We then become... And this is what we're going to look at this morning, the best version of ourselves. In fact, we can become what God has created us to be. We can see the fulfillment of that natural desire and impulse of improvement because of who God is and what he is doing in us. And so this morning, we're going to see from 2 Corinthians how God accomplishes this transformation to make us into the best version of ourselves, this wonderful truth that God makes us into what we were created to be. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians 3, the Pew Bible, the red book there in front of you, it's 818. Or, of course, welcome to use Bible apps and all those sorts of wonderful gadgets, those improvements we have made upon our lives. We're going to focus on two verses this morning, two really profound and powerful and, and really important verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. 
Uh, what's interesting is I was studying this this week and a bit last week as well, is that these verses give us specific details about how God saves us and why God saves us from our sins. And these two verses, really, they allude to, and you can go very deep into theological truths when we understand what they are saying, and it's important to do that, to, to dive deeper into some of these things, because it helps us to truly love God more when we see his amazing grace and mercy and truth and how he works within himself to bring us into relationship with God him it's an amazing thing and so that love then builds our trust in God as we look at these wonders of salvation so follow along with me as I read in 2 Corinthians 3 17 to 18 here's what Paul writes now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom and we too or in we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. We're going to look at more detail here about what do these verses show us or tell us about how it is we can become the best version of ourselves, how we can become fully what God has created us to be by his power and his wisdom. The first thing we want to see from this is that we are able to or we will become the best version of ourselves through faith in Christ because when we trust in Christ, we are set free from sin and the separation from God that brought us. Uh, we're set free from those things and we're brought into relationship with God. Look at verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. First thing I want us to focus on is Paul says this very interesting statement. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. Now, it's possible for us to read that Lord there would be Jesus, but I think it's best to understand Lord here is referring to not Jesus in this verse, but instead he is speaking about God in total, the, the person, the being of God, Yahweh, right? That God is is the Spirit. And so what Paul is telling us is that he's saying, look, what I want you to understand is the Holy Spirit is working in such a way in our hearts and our minds that we can have freedom. And let's look at what this freedom is. Well, what we want to understand here, what Paul is pointing us to is that the Holy Spirit brings freedom from spiritual death by applying Jesus' sufficient sacrifice for our sins. And so we need to step back and say, well, what has Jesus done for us? Well, through his work on the cross, Jesus has accomplished our salvation. He made salvation possible for those who believe, right? Jesus's life and his death and his resurrection are sufficient to forgive us of our sins and bring us into the presence of God so that we can have this relationship with God now and forever. Uh, we're going to go to Romans chapter 6, verses 2 through 7 and 8 and 11. And Paul is going to talk about these wonderful words of freedom that Christ brings because of his death and resurrection and our ability to be included in in what the result of that is. He says, we died to sin. Now, how can we live any longer in it? Right, he's talking about the freedom we now have because of what Christ has done. Verse three, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him, like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, right? There's that lack of freedom, that we are slaves to sin. Verse seven, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And then verse eight, now if we died to sin, with Christ, if we died, excuse me, if now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So what is Paul saying here? He's talking about what happens to us when we trust in Christ, when we believe in Christ. He's talking about what Christ actually did for us on the cross. 
is that in dying for us, Jesus took our sins upon himself. We died with him. We were baptized into Jesus' death. Now, I don't believe here that he's talking about actual water baptism, but he's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, this work of the Spirit that applies what Christ has done for us to our lives, that we identify with what Christ has done. He takes his sin, our sin upon himself. He dies, and therefore it is paid for because of his death. And the result or the effect of Jesus' death was to crucify our sinful rebellion and our sinful nature, right? This talks about the old man that was put to death. He, he crucifies that that was turned away from God in us and he places that upon Jesus. And so when Christ dies, we identify, we are brought into that death with him. The result then of Jesus' resurrection is that the new life, forgiveness, and the righteousness of Christ is applied to our lives so that we're able to stand before God acceptable and brought into his very presence where we can live and know and follow him. And because this happens, we're no longer slaves of sin. We're no longer spiritually dead. We're now spiritually alive and able to live righteous lives in relationship with Christ. And so these verses speak about what Jesus accomplished by dying for us, by rising again. He accomplished our, salvations, our salvation from our sin because of his death and his resurrection. And if we go back to what Paul is talking about then in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, what is he saying? Well, what has been accomplished by Christ, the Holy Spirit now applies to our lives. The first thing the Holy Spirit does in, in applying the work of Christ to us and actually making it effective for our lives is showing us our need for Jesus' right forgiveness. Right? The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and our rebellion and our need for forgiveness. We see this. Jesus is speaking about what the Holy Spirit will do in our world. He says this in John 16, 8. When he comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, listen, we need the Holy Spirit to do his good work in us of convicting us of sin, of showing us what our sin is so that we will cry out for our need for a Savior. Because the reality in all of our life is this, is if we don't know anything is wrong, then we won't seek for a solution. Right? This is true in most of our areas of our life. Ignorance is bliss only goes so far. Eventually, if something, whether a physical health issue or a spiritual issue or a mental health problem or a relational issue is damaged or is damaging our lives, the reality is it's best for us to face that truth and seek the healing and the help that we can get in order to get better. And so conviction is that work of the Holy Spirit whereby we feel things like unsettled when we're unhappy and of course, unhappiness is not always a result of conviction, but this sense of something is wrong, this, we see the consequences of our actions and we know that this is off, that, that movement in our own spirit that God puts there that says something isn't right here in your life. What you're thinking, what you're saying, what you're doing is not helpful. So for an example, the alcoholic realizes that his life is unmanageable, and that he's hurting himself and others because of his drinking, right? That is conviction. It's the awareness that because of this person's dependence, attachment, addiction to alcohol, that, that he's no longer in control of his life, the alcohol is. And at that point, this alcoholic can make a choice to say, I'm either going to get help or I'm going to keep trudging down this path of being under control of this addiction, of giving in, of applying that addiction to my life. And so the truth is that no addict, whether it's alcohol or anything else that we're attached to, will never experience recovery and the ability to overcome that without first admitting what? I am helpless over this addiction. It is damaging me. It is damaging others. If I don't change this, I'm in trouble because I'm not in control of this anymore. It's in control of me. Bring this into our, our lives as well. When our spouse comes to us and tells us, hey, I'm feeling kind of lonely or I'm feeling disconnected from you. I don't feel supported or encouraged when they have these moments of interaction with us. What are these? These are these wake-up calls that says, wait a minute, something is not right in this relationship, and this is the moment when we have an opportunity to start to change it, to do something else. 
And so what we see is that whatever the issue, we're not, when we're not following God's ways of life, when we're not managing our lives without God's help or with God's help, when we're, we're, we're seeking the wisdom and guidance of the world and not God, God comes into our lives and he says, I'm going to convict you of this so that you realize this isn't good. I want to show you the error of your ways. I want to help you see the consequence of your action so that you come to this place when you say, you know what, I need to make this change. This act of conviction that the Holy Spirit does in our lives is his common grace that he gives everyone through the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sinful thoughts and actions. And the Holy Spirit is always going to be working to move us to choose to seek God's forgiveness and God's solution to these problems. But we can resist that conviction and that movement. But God keeps working to bring us to the place when we will confess and repent and seek his ways. And so one of the ways in which the Holy Spirit applies the accomplished work of Jesus for our sins is to say, hey, listen, I'm going to convict you of your sin, of your rebellious ways, so that you realize you need me, that you need Christ. This he does this initially in the sense of when we come to faith in Christ, when we humble our hearts and say, I know I'm a sinner, I know I'm in rebellion, I know that only God can forgive me and he's the only way I can be in relationship with him. I want to believe in Jesus' accomplished work. He does that initially to, to bring us into relationship with God, but he continues to do this as we walk with Jesus, as we still struggle with sin, as we're still tempted by this world. He continually brings this conviction so that we will return to the Lord in deeper and more trusting and more more loving and more obedient ways. So the Holy Spirit first applies the work of Christ by convicting us of sin. Secondly, the Holy Spirit applies the work of Christ by regenerating us or giving us new spiritual life, by freeing us from spiritual death through faith in Christ. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5 is a beautiful text that states this so clearly. And he first begins by describing our spiritual condition as sinners, rebellion against God, and then speaking about how God works to save us and to give us this new life through faith in Christ. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. I love how Paul starts this. He says, as for you, you were spiritually dead. What is he saying? Apart from Christ, we're spiritually dead. Uh, we are spiritual zombies. So anytime you watch a zombie show, think of this verse, right? Living but not alive living but not thriving as God wants us to, living but missing out on the blessing of knowing and loving and obeying God, right? We were dead in our transgressions and sins. Apart from Christ, our spiritual death leads us to indulge in our sinfulness and cravings under the influence. He speaks here of three things, our own flesh, our own sinful desires that are within us. Uh, we're influenced by the world around us that tempts us to turn away from Christ, its ideologies and its idols. And, and we're also under the influence of Satan, our great spiritual enemy, who wants to keep us away from Christ, who wants to keep us in that that spiritually zombified state. And then one of the most concerning parts of this is that apart from Christ, our spiritual death means that we would face God's just wrath for our sins, which is spiritual separation in eternity from hell, uh, in hell from him. But, verse four, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. What is he talking about there? That God loves us. He is merciful. God the Father sent Jesus, the eternally begotten Son of God, into the world to die for our sins. And the Holy Spirit applies that, that accomplished work in our lives to give us newness of life, regeneration, Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, right? Who's he talking about? The Holy Spirit there, who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in 
you. The Holy Spirit gives us spiritual life. He takes us from that spiritually dead state to a spiritually living state. He applies the work of Christ into our lives by giving us new life, by regenerating us. So we see that because of God the Father, because he sent Jesus, the Son of God, to accomplish the salvation that we need, the Holy Spirit applies that salvation, and the result is freedom from sin and a newfound relationship with God. And so then we come to verse 18 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. This amazing work of God that we've just talked about enables us then to become the best version of ourselves through faith in Christ because the purpose of that relationship with God, the purpose of our salvation is transformation, to become more like Jesus. Look at verse 18 of chapter 3 of 2 Corinthians. We and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. So the new reality of life with God is that we are free and able to become more like Jesus in how we think and how we act. That is why he has saved us. And so he sets us free from our sin slavery so that we are then free to live for Christ and obey him. Galatians 5, 13 through 14 says this clearly. You, my brothers, were called to be free, right? We're free to live for Christ. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love, right? This is our calling, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. So salvation is freedom from sin and its control. Salvation is freedom to now live for God's ways and God's purposes. And Paul reminds us that our freedom with sin is not from sin is not so that we can indulge our sinfulness, it's not so that we can say, hey, we're free now to choose to follow and not to follow. No, he says, if you're doing that, you're not understanding the point and the purpose, and you're really not getting the message that what God is going to continually do in your life is move you in to become more like him. No, he says, instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. He specifically applies it in this case to service, of loving, of fellowship, of caring for others. One of the commentary writers, Dr. Halfman, says it this way, by the power of the Spirit, we are experiencing in a progressive sense more and more of this freedom to obey God. And as a result, we are being changed into God's own image by becoming obedient to his will. To be in the image of God is to manifest his likeness by acting in accordance with his commands as an expression of God's own nature. The reality is, is that we are saved in order that we might become more like Jesus in how we think and how we act, our attitudes and our actions. And so now we have new hearts that desire to know and love and follow Jesus. We have a desire to be excellent, right, to reflect the excellent glory of God's moral perfection and works in this world. And so he says in verse 18, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect what the Lord's glory is. Right? We are to reflect who God is and how we think and how we act. And we are being transformed to believe and to act and to think that way. And so that means that our hearts can, we truly desire to reflect God's glory. Right? One of the things that's true about being a Christian is that yes, we, can, we do still struggle with our sin, but there's a struggle in that in that we know it's not right. We're never content in sinful behaviors and thoughts and actions. Why is that? Because that's not who we are anymore. We're people that love God and love who he is and what he's doing in our lives. And we desire to become more like him. And when we're not in that, when we see those imperfections, when we see those idols, when we see that struggle in our life, we're discontent with that and we desire to grow. And so if you're a Christian who's unhappy in your walk with the Lord, I certainly encourage you to say, am I struggling? Am I giving in to sins too often and too regularly? Am I buying into the lies of the world? And am I refusing to allow the Holy Spirit to work in my life to transform me? That's probably, could be certainly the heart of the issue is that we're not fully embracing and relying upon what God has called us to and be it's a child of God becoming more like him, transformed into his ever-increasing glory. Because you see, that's what God is doing. If we're resisting that, he still loves us. He cares about us. He's working in our lives. We're his children. 
But the reality is we're not going to enjoy that relationship to the full extent that we could. And so what Paul is telling us here is that, listen, we reflect God's glory more and more by committing to being transformed in how we think and live and, and by knowing and applying God's word. That's how we get there, right? Paul speaks about the importance of knowing God's word so transformation will happen in Romans 12 too. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will, his good, pleasing, and perfect will, right? We're only going to be transformed when first we recognize that we need to be transformed. And so that begins by recognizing and admitting that, that, this, the, that many of the ways of the world are contrary and opposed to God's way of life, right? This is why Paul starts off and he says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. The reality is, is that much that is in our world is not going to help us conform to that image, especially its overarching ideologies and idols that it offers us and, and beliefs that it offers us that are outside of God's purposes and plans for us as people. Jesus warned us of this, Matthew 7, 13 to 16. Enter through the narrow gate, right? For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They will come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. What is Jesus warning us about? That this world is got all kinds of stuff to offer us and all of us are rushing headlong into destruction because we're trusting in ourselves, we're believing in ourselves and our neighbors are doing that and our political systems are doing that and our philosophical systems are doing that for the most part. And the reality is he's saying it is a broad road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the road. What is the narrow road? Trusting in Christ, believing in God, allowing him to transform who we are. He says, watch out, there are sheep out there, or, excuse me, wolves out there that look like sheep and they are seeking to, just, to uh, lead you astray. He says, look out for their fruit. Then you'll recognize them. So the world offers us many ways of life and ideas about how to live that are attractive to us. And why are they attractive? Because they feed our sinful, selfish desires. They affirm, they confirm those sinful, selfish desires. And so we say, hey, I like this. I like this idea. I like this belief. I like this uh, uh, addiction. Why? Because it uh, confirms, it helps me justify and rationalize my sinful behavior. The world offers us many ways of life and ideas about how to live that sound truthful, that sound even loving, that seem kind, but the reality is they are sinful traps that bring great harm to us. Look what Jesus says, the road is broad. And, and, and I think it's broad. Listen, temptation is, is effective because it tempts us away from the truth, but it does it in such a way that we don't know it's not the truth. Right? Very few of us are tempted by outright evil. Right? If I was the, I better, better be careful, this is recorded, but if I was to stand up and say, hey, we all need to join the Nazi party, you'd all go, okay, he's done being the pastor of Faith Chapel. That's evil. Right? We know that. That's obvious evil. That's a pretty low temptation for us, a pretty stupid m technique. But there's many other ways in which the subtle message of racism, the subtle message of whatever, can creep, creep into our lives that we even start to think, wow, that might be loving, that might be true. Let's go away from the racism thing. But, but the reality is, is that there are many things in our world that are tempting because it paints itself as truthful when in fact it's not truth and it leads to death. And that's where these false teachers come in, right? And leaders out there who will tell us what we want to hear so that we can either justify our sins or think we are even following God's ways. And so we must evaluate with what is being said, what God's word says. Do we compare that? Do we look at the fruit of their ministry and see, is this producing what God said it should produce, which is transform people that look and think and act more like Jesus? If they speak things that are contrary to God's revealed truth, they are harmful. If they practice lifestyles or support lifestyles or ways of life that God clearly condemns in the Bible, they are harmful, regardless of what they look like and how they present themselves 
if they're not doing what God has called them to do, which is to lead people to Christ and his transforming power through the Holy Spirit, to actually look and think and act more like him, they're false, they're destructive, they're on that broad way of destruction. And instead, we need to come back, as Paul is saying, to be transformed in the renewing of our minds, but be aware that the world out there is not always our friend, and often it is not. So not to be conformed, to recognize it, to acknowledge that we can be tempted by it, and to resist it. Well, how do we resist it? We resist it because we are transformed when we learn who God is, who God is in himself, how he lives, how does God treat others, right? We learn about God and his actions, especially through Jesus and how he interacted with people. And then we say, you know what, if that's how God lives and that is how God is calling me to live, then I am going to work hard to think and live and act that way in my life, right? So when we learn of his mercy and compassion, we desire and figure out, Lord, through his power, how are we merciful to others? How are we compassionate to others? We learn of his desire for morality in our relationships with others, and so we live moral lives. We learn of his truth, and we seek to know and live out that truth. We learn of his grace and we seek to be gracious. We learn of his kindness and we are kind to others. I mean, the reality is this list goes on and on and on. It could go on because when we look at who God is and, and who, how he loves us and how he cares for us and how he speaks truth and how he brings justice and what he desires to do, all of that applies in how we live and how we act. But we're only going to know that when we sit before God and his truth of his word, when we sit before God in prayer and ask the spirit to guide us and help us understand and apply that truth to our lives. Dr. Hughes summarizes the freedom we have to live dependent upon Christ and obedient to his ways by saying this, through the work of the Holy Spirit, there's liberation or freedom to do the right thing, to do the right thing, to consider others first, to love others as we ought, to forgive the unforgivable, to return good for evil. And more, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Thus, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom indeed. God is giving us his information of who he is. He's present in our lives through the spirit that we might know him and then we might desire and are able then to become more like him in how we think about others, our attitudes towards others, and how we actually live in this world and how we serve the Lord. And finally, this verse tells us in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that we will become the best version of ourselves because we are transformed into Jesus' likeness by the work of the Holy Spirit as well. We already saw how the Holy Spirit applies Jesus' accomplished salvation to us. Now we're going to see how the Holy Spirit enables transformation in our lives. Look again, 3.18. And we, who with unveiled faces, all reflect the Lord's glory. We're being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. And then the last part, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The great news of the gospel, the great news of scripture is that we are not left on our own power and our own strength and our own will to transform to become like Christ. God, the Holy Spirit, guides and empowers us for that transformation. Three ways he does that. The Holy Spirit indwells us so that we know we are the children of God. In Romans 8, 15 to 16, for you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, these terms of affection, of recognition, of relationship. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. I mean, what a wonderful truth that the Holy Spirit indwells us and one of his roles is to say, Charles, you are a child of God. Everyone else who trusts in Christ, you are a child of God. Never forget that. Know who you are. And since we are God's children, what does it mean that he is present with us through the Holy Spirit? Meaning that we're never alone. We can then trust him in all areas of our life. We can look to him for provision and guidance and care and love and support and truth and the help we desperately need in our lives. Knowing that we are God's children means we can always turn to him for help in this life. And I think that helps to reduce our temptation to turn to the world because when we know who God is, when we know we are his children, when we know he is always present and attentive to our needs, it helps us to say, you know what, I'm stressed, I'm anxious, I'm worried, I'm concerned, I'm tempted, I'm whatever the stuff of life brings. And to say, oh yeah, I'm God's child, he's present, he's here, let me turn to him. He knows what's best. He's shown that through his love and care 
instead of turning to the temptations and the attachments and the addictions of our lives and the world offers. We say, no, I know where that leads. Instead, let's turn to the Lord. Let's turn to the Father who loves us and cares for us so much. The Holy Spirit also brings transformation and guides us in our desires so that we know, love, and follow Jesus. Galatians 5, and 25, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such the things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires, right? He's talking about this because of who Christ is and what he has done, the application of that to our lives by the Holy Spirit. We're no longer ruled by our passions and sinful desires. Instead, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And the Spirit is there to do what? To transform our inner desires and to guide us and show us what that means. What does love mean? What does it mean to have joy of the Lord that comes from him himself? To know God's peace, to have God's patience and kindness and goodness, faithfulness and self-control. Right? These are realities of who God is that the Spirit says, I am going to conform you into the likeness of Christ. He's moving and directing us that we would desire to keep in step with him, knowing that we have been freed from sins, passions, and desires. And the Holy Spirit also gives us wisdom and guidance. He empowers us to know, love, and follow Christ. See this in this great prayer in Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. Here Paul is praying for the Ephesian church, Christians there, but it applies to all of us. What a great prayer. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit, right, of the Holy Spirit who can give us what? Wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. All right, look what Paul's praying. Look what we have is that because of what the glorious Father in heaven has done, he has sent the Spirit to give us wisdom on how to live to help us understand the revelation of God in his word and the personal revelations he will give us on directing the day-to-day -de -day details of our lives. What is the point of this wisdom and revelation? That we may know him better, right? That we may trust him more and love him more and understand him more and rely upon him more. That we might truly know who God our Father is, who the Son is, who the Holy Spirit is. He says, I pray that our eyes would be enlightened why? That we might know the hope to which he has called us, right? Things we've talked about today that we're saved by God's grace through faith in Christ, that it is accomplished because of what Jesus has done, is applied to us by the Holy Spirit, that we are God's children, that he loves us and cares for us, that we have him present now to guide and help and direct and care for us, and we look forward to eternity where all is made right and we're in his presence fully forever. Those are the riches of the glorious inheritance that we have, that we have community with one another where we can encourage and strengthen and help each other to know and love God, and that we would understand this last clause and his incomparably great power for us who believe. The next verse is he talks about how this is the same power that rose Christ from the dead. That, folks, we have the power of God in our lives to live and know and follow Jesus. What an amazing gift that is for us. That we're not alone in this journey to become like Christ. In fact, to become like Christ means that we understand what it means to live daily and moment by moment in the very presence of God who dwells with us through the Holy Spirit. That we understand his truth. That we understand he's enabling us to resist the temptation to be free to do what is right and true and good and beautiful in our lives and the lives of those around us that sin is conquered, that we're free to know and love and follow him. It's an amazing gift. That is how we become the best version of ourselves. That's what God is in the process of doing. And I think it's important to say that the best version of ourselves is not the version that we often want. Because so often that version we want is based upon the ideas of the world. The best house, the nice cars, the great family, all of those things that we think this will give me meaning and purpose. Really, those are attachments as well that we bring to ourselves and this will be it. No, those will always fail us. But instead, what are we looking at? The version of ourselves that God wants is that we look and think and act and behave like Jesus. 
And when we live that way, the amazing thing is that when we become what God wants us to be, when we desire that, when we're striving for that, when we know we're being enabled to accomplish that by the power of the Holy Spirit, what are we doing? We find then the greatest freedom and joy and happiness and meaning and purpose that we can have in this life. And it points us to that, that, that glorious day when we're with God forever, when it's fulfilled. And we are who we are created to be, that best version of ourselves. And so God makes that possible by setting us free from our sins through faith in Christ and giving us a relationship with him. And really, that means his presence with us. And as he's present with us, he is crafting and transforming our attitudes and our thoughts and actions over time to be more like Jesus' attitudes and thoughts and actions. And he's doing that through the Holy Spirit. And he's calling us to cooperate with him in that, that we have a choice in that process. We have a choice to say, Lord, I want to depend upon you today. I want to become what you've called me today. And we strive for that, but we strive for it not under our own power, but we say, I know that God is with me to help me become what he's called me to be. And I can't tell you how this works exactly, but what I know is, is that when I'm desiring and actually working towards by doing things like praying regularly for God's strength, by reading his word, by fellowshipping with my brothers and sisters in Christ, by resisting temptation and confessing my sins when I give in to temptation and seeking to learn for them, God really does do something within me. He does start to transform and give me a deeper love and appreciation for him. He does start to help me to no longer to want those things that I used to depend upon that were so harmful and yet I thought were so great. It changes. Sometimes slow, sometimes miraculously fast, but the reality is, is that God is there present and he's saying, Charles, I have a life for you that's far better than the one you think you're living. And he's saying that to every one of us. And he wants us to enjoy him, to love him, to know him, and follow him and find the greatest life that he has for us. As we come to communion this morning, I think our main goal in preparing our hearts should be to thank God for his amazing mercy, his amazing love, his truth, and his very presence with us that brings freedom from sin and freedom to know him more, to love him more deeply so that we can follow him in all areas of our life. And part of that is to say, Lord, I know that I'm not in some area of my life. I know that I'm holding on to this, that I'm trusting in this, or I'm thinking this idea that isn't what your word has said. And Lord, I don't wanna do that anymore. But mainly I hope what we see today is the glory and the majesty of the salvation that God has brought us. That God is with us because of what Christ has done to accomplish our salvation and because of what the Holy Spirit has done to apply it and he's present with us to transform and change us into the very likeness of Jesus our Savior. I invite the ushers to come forward. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we are grateful for you for the life you give us through the accomplished work, the sufficient sacrifice you made on the cross. As we remember the, your gift of, of your life and your resurrection that brings us life, we are so grateful. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your eternal love that chose us for the foundation of the world to be your children, that you have adopted us and secured us because of what Christ has done in the application of the Holy Spirit's work to our lives, that we are free, that we are new life because of what you have done. Lord, help us to see the majesty of Father, Son, and Spirit working in us. The glory that is you, the glory of your love, the glory of your salvation, the glory of your gospel that changes our lives. And Lord, may we rejoice in that this morning. And may we see what that brings us freedom to, which is to become who you have truly created and made us to be, which is your children, who, who look and think and act more and more like you every day on this earth, and one day we will be glorified. That word itself, teaching and instructing us that we will have excellence in all that we are because you will fully transform us into your image. Lord, may you forever be glorified and praised. May we forever rejoice in who you are and your presence with us.
that we sinners who were rebel rebels against you have been declared right and are being made right so that we will fully enjoy you forever. We pray these things in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen.